This video will cover hypothesis testing about a single parameter in a regression analysis. At the end of this video, you should feel comfortable translating economic statements into null and alternative hypotheses, determining a statistical test appropriate for a given null and alternative hypothesis, interpreting the meaning of a statistical test conclusion using non-technical language, and conducting two-tailed and one-tailed t-tests. Let's start with an example to motivate the logic of a hypothesis test. Suppose we'd like to know how much more or less Americans will spend on domestic travel if their incomes increase over the next decade. What econometric model could we estimate to help answer this question? Our dependent variable should be domestic travel expenditure, and our independent variable should be income. The travel data set has information on these two variables for each U.S. state. We could estimate this econometric model to find the following results. Noting that both variables are measured in dollars, how shall we interpret the estimated slope? For each $1 increase in income per person, travel expenditures per person increase by 11 cents. This number is useful as it would help us to predict the change in travel expenditures for a given increase in income. However, this number alone does not capture our level of confidence in the relationship. How much larger or smaller could the relationship be? Are we even confident that there is a relationship between income and travel expenditures? Hypothesis tests are useful tools for answering these questions and more. Although there are many different types of hypothesis tests, they all follow the same general procedure. We can think of each test as having three distinct steps. First, state the null and alternative hypotheses that correspond to the question at hand. Second, compute a test statistic. And third, compare the computed test statistic to the critical value to decide whether to reject or fail to reject the null hypothesis. Let's discuss each of these steps in more detail to answer the following question. Do travel expenditures have a relationship with income? First, we need to state the null and alternative hypotheses. Intuitively, we are turning our question into a mathematical statement. There are three rules that hypotheses must follow. Let's start by discussing the rules and writing the hypotheses correctly. Later in this video, we'll try to motivate the reasons for these three rules. First, the null and alternative hypotheses are always about the population. In other words, they should be written in terms of the population parameters, the betas, and you should not be referring to the estimates of the population parameters from the regression results. Comparing our statement to the model, we could reason that our hypotheses should should be statements about beta 2, which describes the relationship between income and travel expenditures. Second, equality always goes in the null hypothesis. Recalling our question, there is a yes or no answer. Either travel expenditures do have a relationship with income, or they do not. If there is a relationship, beta 2 is not equal to 0. If there is no relationship, beta 2 equals 0. To satisfy this rule, we should make the latter the null hypothesis and the former the alternative hypotheses. We will denote these as H0 and H1, respectively. Finally, choose the null and alternative hypotheses so that the result you expect is in the alternative hypothesis unless they would be inconsistent with rule number two. Presumably, the fact that we're estimating the regression means that we think there may be a relationship, that is, we expect that beta 2 is non-zero. So our proposed hypotheses are consistent with the third rule. We could call this particular set of hypotheses a two-tailed test around zero. It is two-tailed because our, our alternative hypothesis has a not equal sign. It does not hypothesize that the coefficient is positive or negative. It is a test around zero because zero is the hypothesized value in the null hypothesis. Before we tackle the second and third steps, let's turn to some general intuition. After the null and alternative hypotheses are specified, the test answers a simple question. If the null hypothesis were true, how likely is it that we would observe our data set? If it seems likely that our data set could have been generated, we fail to reject the null hypothesis. If the data seem unusual, that is, if under the null hypothesis, we would have been unlikely to observe data as extreme as our own data set, we reject the null hypothesis. Let's turn to our example. 
If the null hypothesis beta 2 equals 0 were true, then the expected value of the estimated slope should be 0. Of course, it's possible that any given sample of data would produce estimated slopes that are greater than or less than 0, and over repeated samples, we would get a distribution of slope estimates. Although we do not have the luxury of repeated samples with a single real-world data set, we do know something important about the distribution from the regression output, an estimate of the standard error, or the standard deviation of this sampling distribution. Under the null hypothesis, we should expect that the slope estimates have mean 0 and standard deviation 0 0.05. Given this distribution, how likely is it that we would have seen our estimate of 0 0.11? At more than two standard deviations from the mean, this value is in the far right tail of the distribution. It seems unlikely that we would get a value so extreme by chance, or any value far in the tails of the distribution. The test statistic and critical value formalize this idea. The second step is to compute the test statistic. Computing a test statistic requires both the hypothesis and the estimates from the regression. You have seen a variety of test statistics in previous courses. You will see some of those again in this course, and you'll see some new ones. They all make it easier to answer the question we just posed. Is it likely that we would observe our data under the null hypothesis? When performing a hypothesis test on a single regression coefficient, a t-statistic does this. A t-statistic is defined as the estimated value minus the hypothesized value divided by the standard error estimate. This is a generic formula for a t-statistic, but each of these three terms of this expression refer, in this case, to the beta 2 parameter that we are testing. The estimate of beta 2, or b2, is 0.11 from the regression output. The hypothesized value of beta 2, represented with a 0 superscript, is 0 from the null hypothesis. The standard error estimate corresponding to the beta 2 estimate is 0.05, also from the regression output. Plugging in these values, we find that t equals 2.25. Taking a look at the regression output, you may notice this value also appears in the same row as a coefficient. This is a handy shortcut, except when it's not. Be aware that status t statistics apply only to tests centered around 0. This is 1, but you will have, have to calculate t manually for tests centered around other values. One way to think about the t-statistic is, uh, is that it is rescaling the sampling distribution of the parameter estimates. Under the null hypothesis, we, we said we expected a distribution of slopes centered around 0 and having a standard deviation of 0.05. If we divide each slope by the standard error, as in the formula for the t-statistic, the width of the distribution changes. If the null hypothesis contained a value other than 0, subtracting that value when computing the t-statistic would also shift the distribution to be centered around 0. Does this second distribution look familiar? If you are thinking of the standard normal distribution, you're on the right track. This is the t distribution, which has a very similar bell-shaped curve, and in fact, the t distribution approaches the standard normal distribution for very large data sets. Despite this rescaling, the intuition behind the test remains similar. Just as our estimated slope of 0.11 was in the far right tail of the sampling distribution, our calculated t statistic, 2.25, is in the far right tail of the t distribution. This motivates the final step of the hypothesis test comparing the test statistic to a critical value. How far out in the tail does the t-statistic have to be before we reject the null hypothesis? We usually make this choice by choosing a percentage of the distribution in the tails. For instance, if we choose the threshold to mark off 5% of the distribution in the most extreme tails, or 2.5% in each tail for a two-tailed test, there's only a 5% chance that we would see data this extreme if the null hypothesis were in fact true. This 5% is also called the type 1 error rate, or alpha. It is also called the significance level. 1 minus alpha is also called the confidence level, in this case, 95%. The area in the extreme tails is called the rejection region,
because we would reject the null hypothesis if the estimated statistic lies in either of those tail regions. The boundary of the rejection region is the critical value. Like many other distributions, the shape of a t-distribution depends on the degrees of freedom. In this case, the degrees of freedom in the regression, sometimes abbreviated df, is n minus k, or the number of observations minus the number of parameters estimated. Looking back at re the regression results, we have 51 data points and two parameters estimated, the constant and the slope, giving us 49 degrees of freedom. Note that this value is also provided on the output. After we have selected the type 1 error rate and we know the degrees of freedom, we can find the critical value from a table. You can find this in your textbook or in the course folder. For our two-tailed test with a 5% significance level and 49 degrees of freedom, rounding to the closest available value on the table, our critical value is 2.01. This is sometimes denoted as t underscore crit. As a two-tailed test, the critical value applies to both the positive and negative sides of the distribution. We would reject the null hypothesis if the calculated t statistic were greater than 2.01 or less than negative 2.01. A quick comparison shows that we reject the null hypothesis because the calculated test statistic, t equals 2.25, falls in the rejection region's right tail. So what does this mean? Technically speaking, if the null hypothesis were true, there would be no more than a 5% chance of seeing data as extreme as our actual data, that is, data with, a, with as strong of a correlation between income and travel expenditure. It is more common to say simply that we have found a statistically significant relationship between income and travel expenditure. This simpler explanation is fine, but we should always remember the underlying meaning. In particular, there is still a chance for type 1 error, in this case up to a 5% chance that we, we could have seen these data even if the null hypothesis were true. Among other erroneous interpretations, note that this is not the same as saying that there is only a 5% chance that the null hypothesis is true. Let's return briefly to our rules of writing null and alternative hypotheses. Why do we require each of these? First. We are testing something about the population, and we are using the data to make an inference about the population. The data or statistics derived from them should not be a part of our, our hypothesis about the population. Second, the null hypothesis was an essential part of calculating the test statistic. We asked ourselves how likely it would have been to observe our data if the null hypothesis were true. If we have to assume the null hypothesis to calculate the distribution of the test statistic, we need equality in the null hypothesis. With an inequality, there would be many possible distributions of the test statistic depending on the parameter value. Finally, rejecting a null hypothesis is often considered a more definitive conclusion than failing to reject. If we reject the null hypothesis, we have found evidence against it, and the type 1 error rate tells us how confident we should be in rejecting it. On the other hand, failing to reject the null hypothesis simply means that we have not found evidence against it. The chances that the alternative hypothesis is true despite failing to reject the null, also the type 2 error rate, is usually less clear. Now take a moment to try the entire process of hypothesis test with a new question. Suppose a travel agency would like a better understanding of their potential for growth. They ask, is each extra dollar in income associated with more than a five cent increase in travel expenditures. Using this question and the relevant parts of the regression results, take a moment to write the null and alternative hypotheses, test statistic, degrees of freedom, critical value, and conclusion. Use a five percent significance level. You may wish to pause the video for a moment to work through this problem. Now we'll discuss the answers to this question. The question has a yes or again has a yes or no answer. If yes, then beta 2 is greater than 0.05. If no, then beta 2 is less than or equal to 0.05. The latter statement has the equality, so this should be in the null hypothesis. In this case, some econometricians write only equality in the null, while others write a less than or equal to sign.
Either one is fine, as I mean the same thing. We can calculate the t-statistic from the same formula, but the hypothesized value is now 0.05 from the null hypothesis. In particular, note that the calculated t-statistic of 1.27 does not match stated output because this test is not centered around zero. The degrees of freedom remains unchanged at 49, but the critical value is now different since we have a one-tailed test, t crit equals 1.68. We should ensure that we know where the rejection region is located. Given that we are asking whether beta 2 is greater than 0.05, we are interested in large values of t. We should not reject the null hypothesis for values in the left tail because those would be inconsistent with the alternative hypothesis. A quick rule is that the inequality in the alternative hypothesis points towards the rejection region. In this case, the greater than sign points to the right. However, the t statistic falls outside of the rejection region because it is less than t crit, so we fail to reject the null hypothesis. We cannot conclude with 95% confidence that an extra dollar of income is associated with more than a 5 cent increase in travel expenditures.